the only enterprise cold fusion conference on the planet. CF Objective. Okay, so we're gonna start the lightning talks. Uh, for anybody who does not know what a lightning talk is, it is 20 slides, and each slide rotates every 20 seconds. There's no controlling it. The speakers don't press anything. It just goes. So it's either going to be pretty awesome or pretty terrible. Um, we have uh, nine people today. Uh, we have some very, 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 very topics. Um, so it should be pretty entertaining. Uh, as we said, there is a bar at the back, so feel free to get a drink at any time. Uh, please uh, be respectful of the presenters, though, because um, they have put a lot of time in. Yeah. Um, they have put a lot of time in this, so you know, let's try and keep the volume down. Also, remember this is uh, an evening activity, so there will be humor in here. Who knows if it's good? Who knows if it's bad? Adult oriented? Who knows? Uh, so you have been warned. And at this point, I'm going to pass it over. Because I'm also getting reverb. Well, welcome, citizens of the Pan Am. Uh, I do need some tributes, so I'm looking for four brave volunteers to be at tributes before we start my official lightning talk. So uh, some of you I've, I've pre-talked to, and some of you we can just come up. So if I pre-talk to you, come on, Ben. Come on, that's two. We're halfway there. Two more tributes. Oh, wait, it's not supposed to be volunteers. Should I just draw names? <laughs> Jason, one more tribute. For the yeah, that is true. <laughs> this would be, oh, this is a developer conference. Yes, absolutely. So this, I, I actually just designed this talk so I could see uh, Jason and Ben cage match. So <laughs> that's going to be my talk. Hope that's OK. <clears throat> so this is, these are our tributes. So here we go. So welcome. This year, introducing your tributes, we're going to do things a little bit differently. We're going to introduce you by introducing you to food that they typically eat in their region of the Pan Am. So first, of course, we have Mr. Ben Nadell. He is from District, 13, or District 12. And he, of course, hails from the, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And we'll give him a traditional portion of, of food. And then next, from District 11, Byron. Thank you. <laughs> Byron, we will give him, he hails from Ethiopia, a traditional Ethiopian amount of food. Next is Ben. Ben is from Bolivia. We'll give him, you know, they have a little bit more food there. There you go. <laughs> So, last, of course, from your very own District 1, we have Mr. Jason Dean. We will give him a traditional portion of food. Hopefully, he can eat it all. Of course, there's some McDonald's fries. Oh, and a Big Mac. And, of course, a cheeseburger. And a cheeseburger. Oh, whoops. Oh, sir, would you like it? Yeah, would you like a, would you like a dessert? There, there's a dessert and maybe some more fries. Now I think we're all on level, level playing fields here in the Pan Am. Everyone has roughly the same amount. So, somehow my slides got out of order. That's not the next one. Cool. Uh, so one in eight people, I guess I'm going to do this by flying. Uh, one in eight people go to sleep every night. Well, you will be surprised just like I am. Hungry. Okay, so um, it's, this is a problem around the world. And we have the odds stacked in our favor here in the United States. These are really way out of order. I don't know what happened. But, um, so our odds are stacked in our favor here in the United States. You can see, you know, Ben, if you, ate, if you had to eat that, that was, that was your meal every day. Do you think you could survive on that? Not a chance. No. No. And... You know, this is Bolivia. Bolivia, there is a slide later. Wow, this is, can we start over? Can I, it's like really out of order and it's going to be impossible. Simon, help! Senor, you gave me. What's that? It's 
in the order you gave me. No. I can, I can show you the PowerPoint I emailed you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that one's right. Oh, this, see, this says like <laughs> the next they would have went into Christians. That's not Christians. You're going way off. Go up, go up, go up, go up. This was the so one, two, one, two, three, four, five, no, six. That's not six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, not my slide, not my slide, not my slide, not my slide. Not my slide. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Can you identify your slides? Yes, I can. <laughs> Keep going, you haven't hit my slides again. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> All right. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you couldn't have just played along. You could have followed those slides. I, I would have been good for a little while. Then I, when, I, when I got to the Gillette slide, I have no idea what to do. <laughs> Here in America, we have shavers. You can use them. Jason, I'm sure, would be happy to demonstrate. Yes, sir. That's right. Yep, those are right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Perfectionist. That was going to be really hard to do when it's 20 seconds. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you don't have to apologize. <laughs> yeah. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. He said bring them up. Each, each PowerPoint individual. No. No? It's They're impossible. Not programmed? You can't do it. Still doing something. Okay, let me look. I'm missing the background. That's cool. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Is your media up? Is your media up? I'm from Ethiopia. No, you're Bolivia. Oh, you're Bolivia. Sorry. I'm Ethiopia. Yes. Democratic Republic of the Congo. I know where he's from. <laughs> He's almost ready. <laughs> Sorry. No, you want a mic. Jason's taking a mic. So, tomorrow night, wow, that's loud. <laughs> tomorrow night, if you've never been to Cold Fusion or CF Objective, or if you, uh, if you have been here and don't know about the Birds of Feather sessions, they are tomorrow night. And uh, Birds of Feather sessions are just informal. Uh, get together and talk about the things that interest you. Uh, tomorrow night we're going to have five Birds of Feather sessions starting at 8 o'clock. Uh, there's going to be a Meet the Adobe team, where the Adobe product manager and, and the others from the uh, Cold Fusion team are going to be here uh, to talk about that, talk about Cold Fusion in general, answer your questions where they can. I'm sorry? I don't think so. Uh, there will be a buff on uh, test-driven development and automated deployment. Are you done? All right. And there's going to be a board game boff. That's the important one that I'm trying to pitch. Board games, 8 o'clock, probably in this room. I brought a ton of board games. I love to teach them. Woo <laughs> hey, board games are awesome. I, wonder, I don't think it'll auto-advance, but we'll, we'll go. All right. So I'm not going to start all the way over. Now, we had a little technical difficulty. We paused for a little bit and let a couple other people straggle in. So I'll set it up just generally again. Democratic Republic of the Congo, District 12, District 11, Ethiopia, District 9, Bolivia, and then our very own District 1, Mr. Jason Dean with his pile of food. Okay. You represent all of us here in America, maybe also. So what I've done here, I kind of took a little liberty. This is roughly a meal for each of these countries. Um, and this is the average daily caloric intake in those countries. So you can see the, the, the medical, medical science does. We need roughly 2,000 calories, maybe 1,500 if you're not very active. 
to survive. So three of the two of the three countries represented here barely have the average. You know, that's not just uh, the poor people. This is the average daily caloric intake for that country is below what we say we need to su survive and thrive. So that is obviously a problem. So it's causing a problem throughout. And then if you look at some of our, our representative countries here, so I think there's some people from the UK, Canada, the US. The US, our daily average caloric intake is 3,745 calories. It's no wonder we have an obesity problem. And that's actually, I don't know, that's a little bit more than maybe one of our, our meals a day, but not, not it is McDonald's, so it's, there's a lot of fat in there. The other problem that we have is, right, the, what kind of calories are we taking in? Here we get lots of proteins, lots of healthy calories. Where there, there's, it's hard to come by protein, so they're eating a lot of grains and things like that. That was definitely more than 20 seconds, so I'm going to have to auto-advance it. Um, so see, the odds are ever in our favor. Uh, we can, we have everything that we need. But when you're hungry, can you imagine if you were trying to develop software and you went to bed every night hungry? and you were trying to develop, and now you have to worry about that pain and where am I getting my next meal from, how are you going to develop software with that pain? How are you going to be able to think straight? So th this causes a very large disadvantage in this, these countries, so there's this cycle that happens, and this poverty cycle, and it's hard to break that cycle. And I think one of the ways that we can break that cycle is, is by distributing food more evenly. See, we live in a very food-blessed area. No, you can't. No sharing. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, eventually, you can share. See, we live in a very food-blessed area here in, the, in America. We have everything that we need. But we don't realize, maybe some of us do, but if you don't get outside and, and maybe travel to some of these places, you don't realize what a problem it actually is. So that's why I wanted to give this talk. I wanted to raise awareness. This is the hunger map from the UN. You can see District 1, where all the green on there. Well, those countries in red are in severe, uh, have severe hunger problems. They're to the point where millions of people are dying from simple lack of food. And this is a problem because we don't have that. We have plenty of food. We have an obesity problem in America. We have companies like Dan's that are around trying to solve that. Thanks for sitting up front. Um, one in eight people in the world is going to go to bed tonight hungry. How many of us are going to go to bed hungry tonight? Right? None of us in this room. So we're, we are not one of those eight. So you go outside of here, that statistic raises even more. Because here we have so many things stacked in our favor. As they say, the odds are ever in our favor. So the problem that we have isn't just that or in the world isn't, isn't that there's nothing that can be done about it. It's a distribution problem. This is one of my favorite quotes around it from Martin Luther King Jr. It says, why should there be hunger and privation in any land, in any city, at any table, when man has the resources and scientific know-how to provide all mankind with the basic necessities of life? See, we're smart people and I think we can solve this problem. It's not a supply problem. The world has enough food. It's not that there's too many people. I think that's a misconception. There's enough food in the world for everyone. It's just not distributed very well. So it's a problem that's out there that can be solved. And there's lots of organizations that are trying to solve it. And so I encourage you to start looking for organizations. One that my family personally supports, my wife has been uh, to their feeding program. It's called the International Voice of the Orphan. Um, they have a feeding program in Uganda trying to solve it there. Um, I have a son that's from Ethiopia. I've been to Ethiopia. I've seen the problem there. We support organizations there as well. Look around. You will find organizations that are doing great things on the ground that, that you're going to believe in that maybe aren't mine, but I wanted to at least highlight one that I believed in, um, and that you can become part of the solution instead of part of the problem, and we can get the food of the world distributed more, even, more evenly. Thank you. Now you can show <laughs> Thanks. Thank you guys very much. So that's a uh, very important thing, uh, food, which is why we decided to extend that presentation with a skit about technical problems, so you guys could think about it some more. Um, and I'm just going to make sure we don't have any more skits planned.
for the next one. So in a minute we have Dan Wilson talking about the other fusion. Not that we're waiting. So just so you all know, um, there is a live episode of CF Hour right after this. Um, the keynote person will be one of the people who is interviewed. There will also be some free Software? Yes, free software. Woohoo! No, unfortunately. <laughs> it's CF Builder. Same thing. We can, we can get that later, guys. We can get it later. You good? All right, Dan Wilson. Before I begin, let me apologize for my voice. To answer any questions, yes, I have been gargling porcupines. All right, did anybody hear that? Jokes in the back? Okay, thank you, thank you. Because I can't hear a thing right now. All right, here we go. So we're gonna talk about the other fusion. We work in cold fusion. Um, in scientific circles, cold fusion is laughed at, but there is another side of fusion that you might find interesting. So let's talk about it. <laughs> At any point in time that would work for the slide deck. Okay, here's a slide of global energy demand. It goes out to 2030. Notice how it spikes up. It's not gonna go down. We all have iPhones, iPads, Androids, and we want them charged. We can also see the share of fossil fuels. This is also going up. Depending on your politics and beliefs, you can decide how long we'll have this but it won't be forever. We're not going to talk about this fusion, although I could probably use this, and some of you could as well. What we're going to talk involves energy, and energy is a very precious thing. <laughs> doo, 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 doo. We're also not going to talk about this fusion. While this does create energy, in the form of me pounding my head against my desk at times, it is not going to solve the global energy problem. Thank you, whomever posted this on images.google.com. <laughs> We're also not going to talk about cold fusion, the scientific version. Cold fusion, the scientific version, purports that you can fuse elements together and produce energy at room temperature. There have been many experiments. They've all been laughed at. None of them work. If someone offers to sell you a cold fusion generator, don't do it. We're not going to talk about this version of nuclear energy either. This is fission. It's the one that blows stuff up. It's not very pretty. Um, this is the ugly part of our history, and it's unfortunate that, f that the, the, the fission was weaponized and more research was put into that versus fusion. So here's a map of nuclear waste shipments. Fission produces nuclear material because what it basically does is it splits apart unstable atoms and it produces a waste material that decays over a long period of time. It's ugly. Find your city on this map. Are there trains passing by with deadly material? It's not a good sight. Here is an example of a reactor that went wrong. 
Thankfully, there's a large Pacific Ocean because here, the wind blows from Japan to the U.S. You can see the U.S. was impacted. Were you impacted? I don't know. Do you feel funny? Do you have a strange itch? <laughs> so fusion can save the day. Today, as a matter of fact, a nuclear reactor 25 miles from my house was shut down because they found a crack in it. I told my wife it'd be a real good day to go to the beach. Get way away from there. Not sure if she did it or not. So let's talk about fusion. Fusion is powerful. Here's how it works. Rather than splitting atoms apart, two atoms come together. They form a new atom. In this case, two hydrogen atoms form a helium atom. It kicks off a neutron and puts out a lot of energy. Matter of fact, 10 milligrams of a fuel pellet can produce as much energy in 42 gallons of oil. So one method is called inertial confinement. They basically hit a pellet of fuel with lasers and it implodes. And this compresses the, the two hydrogen atoms which fuse together and produce energy. They've been testing this since 1970. It doesn't really work yet. It's kind of sad. Here's another method, magnetic confinement. Picture an inside out donut and you spin around plasma. This plasma fuses together. It's at 180 million degrees Fahrenheit right now. In order for this to be viable to produce energy, it will have to be tripled. A new technology is called maglif. It fuses inertial confinement with magnetic confinement, and it's been in testing since 2013. They expect to break even in 2018. Basically, they hit a pellet with a laser. It implodes. They hold the plasma with magnetic force. It produces energy. Another kind, which came out from Lockheed Martin, and there's not a lot of information on this, is called high beta fusion reactors. Rather than building a multi-billion dollar power plant, this will build power plants that will fit in the back of a truck. They're expecting to have this commercialized in the very near future. Rather than going to market in 2050 or 2070, they think they can produce power in 2023. I'm actually rather excited by this. As you can see by the timeline, the other competitive plants aren't going to be around until 2040 to 2080, where I will not have a chance to see that. I don't think I will. Now, as a comparison, half a bathtub of seawater, which actually contains the special hydrogen atoms that we need to produce this power, has the same power as 40 train cars of coal. Think about that for a second. That's a lot of coal. There's a lot of power you can generate from that coal, and we have a lot of seawater. Lots of seawater. Two-thirds of the Earth is seawater. That's a lot of seawater. <laughs> That's a lot of bathtubs. And here's the great part about it. When a, when a fusion reactor freaks out and goes bad, you know what happens? Nothing. Because there's no boom. Getting a, a, a fusion reaction to actually work is so difficult. If it stops working, it just stops working. It's not a big deal. It's annoying. You won't get your iPod charged, but we're not going to explode or decay in any radioactive mass, and I'm down with that. So we can see from this map, there's plenty of energy demand, and it's only going to get worse as we come up with more great electronic things that we all need. We expect a reliable power supply that's consistent because we want our stuff to work when we flip the switch. So in my mind, in the future, fusion is the only answer because it's stability, it's peace, it's clean, and it'll meet our needs well into the future. Thank you very much. Yay, the slides worked. All right, so Ben Farrell. So this one is uh, slightly different. So before we start it, we'll just explain it. Um, to the best of my knowledge, you've not seen these slides before. Don't know what I'm presenting on. So he has no idea what these are on these slides, and he's going to entertain you with his awesome knowledge. And it's started. I just realized this is my first lightning talk I've ever done. <laughs> yeah, go. You're, you're, you're running. All right, we starting? Yeah. I am here to talk about a special door in my life, door 14. Um, this, is, this is taken by me back in uh, 
1982 uh, with my black and white camera. Um, this is my uncle. He's he's an awesome singer. Uh, he he came in that door. This is why it's such a special moment to me because he came in that door 14 and just started belting out some tunes. It was so it was so awesome. He had some great pipes. Um, I actually have that jacket today. It's in my car outside. Um, uh, yeah, he uh, and and this guy. He, this is my uncle's weird friend. I don't know. Uh, I never found out his name. Um, he did give me my first beer though. He's he's pretty cool. I I, I, I like his shirt. Uh, um, I'm not a fan of the white jeans, though. I mean, uh, maybe they worked back in 82, but yeah, this is, this is my friend's weird uncle. He's a singer, too. Um, this is actually me. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, 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 was a, I was a rock musician uh, way back in the day. Um, you know, uh, so it, it was really loud, and I forgot most of it. Um, <laughs> It jumbled my brain a little bit. Uh, but yeah, so this, this other guy, I don't even want to talk about him. <laughs> I'm, really not. I'm not. Let's move on. I'm waiting. Fine, I'll say I like his afro. Okay, so this guy, oh, he's, um, yeah, yeah. He, he, he's interesting because uh, there was a time when he was going to be uh, the next Doctor Who, but um, <laughs> they didn't pick his part. Uh, I guess he just, he liked to play guitar more than act, I guess. Um, that's, that was the problem. Uh, we all hung out um, in a van um, and we solved mysteries. Um, and I, I dug, I dug the, uh, I dug, what is that called, the ascot? That was a great fashion statement uh, way back uh, when we were all playing this band together. Um, I think this was, well, this was, this was our photography shoot that we did, uh, you know, I, think we, I think it was in Vegas. We were in our van solving mysteries in Vegas, and this was, this was part of that, that awesome concert we had. Um, and uh, I think he's going through some hearing loss right now, um, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and, it, you know, you saw those speakers that were, you know, they were incredibly loud, so of course he's going to, like, cover his ears up. Um, now, that was the name of our band. I forgot to tell you guys, Roxy Music. Um, it was it was just an awesome band. I, I, you know, I was really young. I think I was like five years old. But I, you know, it was it was fantastic. So Roxy Music, um, it was so named because we were musicians. I won't get into the Roxy part though. Um, this guy's weird looking, right? <laughs> Who is that guy? I don't remember him. Was that that might be? You might be right. I think that's Roxy. Um, I don't know what to say about him. Wow. No, he was the he was a mixing guy. Yeah, I mean we're in the studio now, so a lot of these guys, you know, I, I just don't remember them because they were the mix. We were the talent. Uh, we were good at what we did. We didn't care about all the little people do, running the mixing boards and smoking their cigarettes. I, I mean, this guy, he's nothing today. Nothing without us. So, wow. He's like a muppet, isn't he? I think I remember him from Sesame Street. <laughs> I like that guy. He's pretty shaggy. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like I said, we're all musicians in Roxy, the Roxy Music Band. Is that what I called it? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, um, oh, is that Bowie? I will say, I didn't want to, I didn't want to like say, but we definitely performed with Bowie. It was a great scene. Um, yeah, Bowie, Bowie was awesome. He, uh, he had, a, he had a side business detailing cars at the time, and, uh, you know, he did a great job, but he, he kind of screwed up my fender a little bit, um, but as you can see, he's, a, he's an awesome musician. Um, play, I didn't know he played the acoustic guitar. I'll have to ask him about that when I get home. Um, he, he, uh, he lives in my attic. <laughs> How many Bowie slides do we have? Lots? Oh, okay, there we go. Um, wish, I don't know what this means. <laughs> but yeah, so these were like uh, MM was our it, they were the evil band they were our counterparts, they were our evil counterparts um, when we were going in a van solving mysteries, MM they, they were actually, they were actually we pulled, we, they were the evil villains um, Led Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin I want to say I performed with them and, I, and that's right, I did um, <laughs> David Bowie me, when I was five Led Zeppelin, um, yeah, it was awesome. Melody Maker, 
that was the that was the magazine, not the band. Sorry, I screwed that one up. Um, these are the Beatles. Yes, we played with the Beatles. It was awesome. It was, I, I'm going to shout it out loud. I played with the Beatles. Come on. Um, and uh, you know, this is my signature, uh, Ben Farrell. I signed I signed the Beatles autograph for them. Um, and that's it. I think uh, I think that about covers it because I'm awesome and I play with the Beatles. Thank you. Wow. Never seen those slides before, and you would not be able to tell. It was awesome. Awesome. So next we have Adrian Marino and my multi-monitor standing desk. Round of applause, please. Thank you. Trip over some stuff here. All right, so my first computer was an Apple IIe way back in the day. I had like a, I forget, like a 9 inch or 11 inch color CRT monitor. Uh, then in college, I had a little 13 inch monitor on the sodium 5 megahertz Packard Bell. And uh, I thought that was great because, hey, 13 inches is better than 9 inches is great. Uh, and I think I ended up uh, with like a 19 inch later on. These, uh, when I got my first corporate job, or my, regularly, this was my second corporate job. Every developer had two monitors, right? So we all bought two monitors for home, right? These are 19 inch ViewSonic, uh, 1920, or yeah, 19, or 1600 by 1200 resolution, about $400 a pop, right? And this is, you know, like it says, uh, I was late on the Matrix, right? So the Matrix came out in 99. I saw this after I got two monitors, and then I saw this set up, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I need more monitors. Right? And this is like my dream setup, right? You can just over here, it's like, you know, the guy's like talking about he can see all this stuff in code and you really see this and I'm just thinking, ooh, you know, JavaScript, CSS, HTML, it's all good. Uh, so I ended up working at an insurance company. I got stuck back with a single monitor at work. Now they tried having dual monitors. They did a trial with our claims department, but there was a guy that really didn't care for that setup. I don't think he wanted the expense. I just don't think he believed in it. He pretty much sabotaged the whole setup. He told them how to use two monitors. Uh, rather than them think, discovering how to do it themselves. So later on, I end up at my current company, uh, and this is the setup that they sent us, right? It's a 19-inch Lenovo monitor that's hooked up to a 17-inch screen. The, the laptop screen, well, actually, both of these are like 1440 by 900. At the very least, I have two screens again, so I can get some work done, but these are really small screens, and I really couldn't deal with it, right? So now I get moved into a cube out of our conference room because we're real small, we're growing a lot. I've got all this space available to me, and I'm like, this monitor's really tiny. And the laptop screen, I have to keep closed sometimes because it's just annoying. So, you know, I'm just like, I I've got to get something bigger and better, right? And of course, I'm in Texas, so everything's bigger and better in Texas. I got a 28 inch monitor, 1920 by 1200 resolution. This thing was on sale at Newegg for like 260 on Black Friday uh, that year. So I actually bought one for myself and I bought one for my best friend who's our director of project management. So he's got the same monitor and he's got, you know, full screen, just massive spreadsheets and MS project stuff. Uh, I took that little side monitor, I bought this, this uh, monitor arm off of Craigslist for like $40. Uh, I've got it in portrait mode and it sits up there, so I always run Cold Fusion by the command line and I have other things running by the command line, so I can actually tail out all these uh, log files and see things that are there. If I dump, console to out, uh, dump the, the output to console, it shows up in there. Uh, then about a year or so later, I found another one of these monitors on Craigslist for $200. So I went in and picked that thing up filled up all the space that I had in my cubicle and I was having a grand old time because I could get so much stuff done uh, I would lose my mouse and thankfully Windows has a little has a little way to assign a key you can hit the uh, command and it'll like put a little blip radar thing on around your mouse because I lose it all the time uh, so uh, right now there's a there's a new show on the National Geographic Channel that's called the numbers game they talk statistics all sorts of stuff and the New York Times, Forbes, and a number of other companies or websites have been putting up stuff talking about how sitting is really damaging to your health. So, uh, you know, this is information that comes from the Number Game Show. I think the, the guy's name is Jake Porway, is the scientist that's in charge of this whole thing. And look at these things. I mean, these are kind of horrifying when you look at this stuff, right? They have a, they have a, se a segment that's on there. They talk to a company about all this stuff. And I'll tell you, I, I, I gained a heck of a lot of weight when I was sitting there working 12 hours a day. I mean, I'm big now. You should have seen me a few years ago. Right? So now this is a screenshot from this, from this thing. 
uh, my boss is sitting over there. He's actually doing a POC at home where he's got a table and a couple of end tables sitting on top of it. And the monitor is sitting on top of the end tables. And there's a monitor sitting on the side because he couldn't fit them on the side. And keyboard over here. And the phone's crammed under something else. So, you know, there's all sorts of ways to get this stuff done. Now, there are a lot of shops out there that sell these standing desks, right? They're really expensive. When you go out there and you look at these things, they have mechanical, uh, you know, they have engines on them that basically can raise and lower things. The problem is, is that if you've got a desk that can either stand or sit, statistics say eventually you'll sit all the time, right? So this is the IKEA jerker desk. It's like the, it is like the, the number one nerd desk that's out there. It was actually discontinued last January, right? It was about 120 new. I bought this off of Craigslist for $80. And all of my stuff sits on top of this thing. It stand up all the time. The phone, and my phone is actually behind the laptop on the docking station. And that's why I have the headset there so that I can use that because I don't use the phone a whole lot. So the first thing is when I set this up, you're going to stand all day? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Don't you need like a big tall stool? No. So you're going to stand all day? Yeah. So, um... The problem with standing all day is that your legs and your feet are going to get really tired. I've made it about three and a half days because I was just procrastinating going out and getting an anti-fatigue mat, right? Well, after a couple of days, my legs were burning. So I went out and I went to Home Depot. I got the one that's on the left for about $20. The one on the right I found over at Lowe's. I used the one on the right at home with this desk because I'm usually bare feet or in my socks. The other one, you can't really stand on it with uh, your bare feet. So I found both of these monitors on Craigslist, 160 bucks a pop. I found this same desk on Craigslist for $80. Has all this other stuff on here. It's my desktop computer. My desktop computer actually has an Ifinity card in it, so it can run three monitors at once. I just have the two. Um, so this is back at my office again. I was getting a whiteboard set up next to my desk, and the maintenance guys that were hanging it over there, the guy comes over to me, and this is about 40 pounds ago. So the guy uh, got something, he's like, hey, so what do you do here? And I said, well, I'm a software architect. He's like, really? I thought you were the DJ, you know? <laughs> uh, and I'll be standing there, you'll be listening to all this stuff, bopping around, you know, it's really good. So this is the latest stuff, right? The other, the, the, uh, this is from uh, Jeff Atwood's site, coding, codinghorror.com. There are all these Korean monitors that are basically the LCD, LG panels that are out there that are running $800 over at, over at Dell right now. Like right now, Dell has them on sale for $800, right? You can pick these things up for $400, $200. Uh, you go to Micro Center, you go to uh, uh, a couple other places online and find these things that are incredible. Uh, so I've been more productive because I'm not falling asleep at my desk because I'm standing up all the time and it's really difficult to fall asleep when you're standing up. Uh, obviously, I've got a lot more energy than I usually than I used to have, uh, and actually, uh, you know, I gave up sodas. I've, I'm almost completely off of, off of caffeine, and last year I lost 130 pounds, and this is what helped me. but hit twice. So 130 pounds. That is, you know what? Another round of applause. That is just ridiculous. So speaking of losing, the opposite of that is winning. So for CF Hour, after this, when they do their live uh, broadcast, they have some additional items which you can win. See, segue, segue, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Awesome. So now we have Adam Tuttle, and I'm not even going to say what it's about. Uh, How do I start it? All right. Uh, okay. Uh, I forked two child processes, ages four and 2.3. Uh, our household refrains an infinite loop of, Daddy, read to me. Uh, Dr. Seuss is my favorite for creativity and style, so if you guys don't mind, uh, let's walk a Seussian mile. Imagine a pub in Galway with an Irish folk sound where faster than you can drink them, everyone's buying around. That is what it's like to develop open source. Uh, you make friends with similar interests and sometimes they're Norse. Uh, did you realize that uh, this world would not be the truth without Cohen and Torvalds, Stallman and Newth? The phrase open source coined by Newth concedes with purchase comes the right to customize for your needs. Cohen wrote BitTorrent, which I'm sure you have heard. Uh, whether or not you admit it, you rotten pirate, you turd. <laughs> Torvalds wrote Linux and Stallman GNU, and all are incredible and benefit you. You owe a debt to Tim Berners-Lee, you with your Etsy shop selling hand-knitted bees, happily eBaying your dusty old TV, 
all made possible by Timmy's HTTP. <laughs> Sharing is nice. After all, who doesn't like free beer? But giving away work pays zero dollars a year. Or does it, you say, when for jobs you impress? Does your GitHub account say that you care more or less? What's in a name? A lot, don't you know? Yeah, you can get that on Stack Overflow. Turn your name into money? Why, yes, but of course. Support open source projects as professional open source. There's also a rare breed that's willing to invest. The occasional backer will fund a feature request. So with the case now outlaid that there's money to be made, we turn our attention to intrinsic motivations in spades. Just as a batter must practice his swing, so too must you with concatenation of strings. The cones is a great way to stay as sharp as steel, but to be truly tested, a project must be real. They call it sharpening your saw, and that's not entirely wrong. Coding in public does bring pressure that's strong. Best practices, anti-patterns, and object orientation, all skills you can learn through public creation. Your brain is a muscle like your biceps and your heart. If you don't use it, you won't be as smart. I'm not calling you dumb for not sharing code, but practice your craft and your career will explode. More than 50% complete, and this talk is replete with speech that makes code sound like a project complete, but if your surname's Mahano, or you get off the same way, you writing my docs will make my damn day. We have wikis and forums and roadmaps and tests and a contribution to any of which we're all thrilled to get. Lest we forget about bugs, even bugs about fonts, they mean you've got users and that's all anybody wants. Don't feel bad about filing bugs as long as you're polite. I can't speak for Mike Hankey, but most of us don't bite. The only thing better than a bug report pest is when your bug includes a well-written test. If it's how you roll, a blank canvas is exciting, but can be more to chew than you thought you were biting. Before starting anew, ask if your help is desired. Competition breeds innovation, but contributions are admired. A good open source project is a perfect storm in which an idea, some motivation, and ability mix. And then a baby is born with those first few commits, and much like a toddler, it'll sure test your grit. A rising tide raises all ships, as the saying often goes, so if cold fusion's the pool, then open source is the hose. For cold fusion to thrive, we must not estrange. If you want it to survive, you must be the change. True but unfortunate, open source is dominated by guys, but we're happy to welcome anyone willing to try. Left field contributions are my favorite surprise, regardless of the hardware hidden between your thighs. <laughs> Open's not free and free's not open, but that's being pedantic, uh, and definitely a topic for another Susian semantic. Gretzky said, you miss 100% of shots you don't take, so if you'll allow me to adapt, we refuse 100% of pull requests that you don't make. And on that note, I'm afraid I must dash. I'm dropping the mic like Adobe Drop Flash. <laughs> Nathaniel Francis, uh, you have to follow that. Telling of a different kind, no? <laughs> Bet you all wish you had my grandmother right now, don't you? You know what the funny part is? This is my brother's. I didn't have mine, I couldn't find it. 
Oh, wow. That's a hard act to follow. You did a really good job. <laughs> All right. On October 30th, 2012, Lucasfilm Limited was purchased by the Walt Disney Corporation for cash and stock option. Over $4 billion, it seems the mighty empire of Disney had won yet another victory. You see, Disney's a lot like Microsoft. You can complain, you can whine, they can make huge mistakes, but they're still winning. This unholy alliance is enough to make anyone squirm. You see, on the one side, we have the great champion against the system when he was a young man, allied with the slightly effeminate protagonist of the Disney Corporation and his ridiculous-looking friends. It's just about enough to make anybody do this. Now, obviously, I am officially suggesting nobody hurt yourself. I'm just trying to explain. I understand how Mr. Solo feels right now. You cannot do this to Star Wars. Because Star Wars is definitively awesome. This right here, that is how I first saw Star Wars. My very, very rich family owned a black and white TV, and I think the actual resolution on the screen is much better than when I originally saw it. But you see the dynamics, you see the lights and the darks, and every one of those characters just came to life on that screen for all of us to enjoy and to see. And then when you moved forward, you just had these memorable images. I mean, this is a reproduction of Ralph McQuarrie's original concept for Jabba's Palace. And see how faithfully they rendered it in the movie. We can all remember C-3PO and R2-D2 making their way there. But fortunately, we did buy a color TV eventually, because otherwise this would look like crap, right? I mean, it's all greens and browns. Chewbacca's blending in with the woods. But it's just every one of these moments we can remember. We can grasp a hold of because it's awesome. And they're images that you'll never forget. You run into any of these in public, you instantly think Star Wars. He might be wearing a kilt playing the bagpipes on a unicycle, that's Darth Vader. And everyone who saw that YouTube video, you know exactly what I mean. You saw they said, wait a second, isn't that Darth Vader? What's with the bagpipes? But you know what, that's not why Disney bought it. Not at all. That's why. You're talking about probably the greatest 20th century major blockbuster worldwide. This is a photo taken in 1977 in China. Allow me to read a quote. I'm going to totally mess it up. I did. It's a quote by J.J. Abrams. He says that probably more than any other movie of the 20th century, Star Wars affected our generation. Probably everything we have ever done or engaged in has somehow been related to seeing or being somehow affected by those movies. That is not the next slide in this presentation. <laughs> it's so embarrassing. It's all right. No, it goes the wrong way if you hit space. Anyway, I'm going to hold on. Anyway, I'm just going to make an argument as to why Abrams is the right choice. I think Disney's the wrong choice, but Abrams is the right choice. Um, the slide we're skipping is, um, he actually wrote Armageddon regarding Henry and Forever Young. Now, while those may not be our favorite movies, those movies starred Mel Gibson, Harrison Ford, and Bruce Willis and company. And so he got a really, really good start. He got into TV doing a little romantic drama that was kind of like a, a pre-Gilmore Girls called Felicity. And then he got into mainstream. Um, any of you guys see Alias? That was a pretty cool show. I'm going to talk about Spies, Kick Butt, and probably most of Jennifer Garner's career, right? Until she married Ben Affleck and he started directing movies about the 70s. After that, we got Lost. Now, Lost may not be everybody's cup of tea. That show sported the most expensive TV pilot ever made in television history. And that not only did it have science fiction in it, but every single one of those characters you see on that screen each had at least one, if not many, episodes dedicated to them because he's not about just making action. He's about characters. Tom Cruise saw Alias. He thought, hey, this is cool. I like it. Made friends with J.J. Abrams, and he told him, you know what? You want to be M.I.? Abrams went on to write and direct M.I. 3, and he still produces for the Mission Impossible franchise. Some people think M.I. 3 was the best. I'm just one of those people. This is probably my favorite television show. You see the little logo down there? 
Fox had Lucas in court for 20 years, George Lucas, and they treated Josh Whedon, the great, as if he was some unwanted intern. Abrams fixed that. They published the last season and a half of Fringe at a financial loss. And that, in the science fiction community, is why he was given Star Trek. The first meeting he had with his creative team is said, we need to make two sides here. One, what did you love about Star Wars? Classic Star Wars. <laughs> and what did you hate about Star Trek? They made Star Trek as close to Star Wars as they could, which puts this man between two worlds. The classic Star Wars that he loved and this new Star Trek that he had shaped like it. So how do you make a new Star Wars? Well, you have to do something classic. And that does not mean you hire Mark Hamill, Harrison Ford, and Carrie Fisher. It means you keep John Williams. Because we all remember John Williams made the difference. So what we have left to us, we got a complete and entire sellout on one side who is done and gone, and I hope he buys a fishing pole. Now on the other end, we have a guy who has made a big difference in the science fiction community, and he loves classic Star Wars. J.J. <laughs> Abrams is the answer. We are going to get a rockin' new Star Wars movie. I'm done. So we have now the man, the mystery, the Tim Cunningham. Yeah. Space. Okay. Yeah, Doctor Who. Like my Doctor Who suit. So I am talking about my open source media center. So wanted to get away from my amazingly huge Cox bill. Uh, <laughs> I mean, look at it. It's just ridiculous. I mean. You're paying for all these channels you don't want, watching shows you don't really care about, in quality that's sometimes suspect. So I wanted to cut that cable bill and fire them, but here is the parameters. I wanted a low cost to entry. I didn't want to spend a lot of money. I wanted it to be expandable. It had to be flexible. I didn't want to be tied to one particular vendor like Google or Apple. Uh, and I wanted to have multi-purpose. It had to do more than just feed me TV shows and movies. And it had to be easy enough for my mom to operate. So I did lots of research. I looked at the different things that we have, Apple TV, Google TV, the Roku, the Boxy, uh, WTV Lite, and XBMC. I went with XBMC for the reasons you see here. It plays Hulu, Netflix, Amazon Prime, does local files, network files, it does game emulation, maximum resolution, and it will even run on a Raspberry Pi. Do you know what this is? A little Raspberry Pi. This is $35. It has dual processor, ARM, processors, HDMI out, does 1080p for $35. And I install RaspBMXC, so it's a design for the Raspberry. So I can put it on here, and for $35 I can hook it up to a monitor, and now I have a media center. I can run it on Linux, I can run it on my son's uh, Ubuntu laptop, my wife's Android Nexus, uh, you can hack Apple TV and run it, you can run it on a Mac, you can run it on Windows, you can run it pretty much on any platform. Of course, you do have to jailbreak your iPhone and your iPad if you want it to run on that. And it is, does lots of different things besides just movies and TV. Uh, down here in the bottom, I see there's a music collection. So you can catalog all your music, put it on a NAS, and stream it across the network. You can check the weather in any sort of country. So it does lots of different things other than just television, and it's free. So how do you get your content? That's the main thing. It's nice to have 1080p, but you need something to watch. Well. You can sign up for Amazon Prime, you can sign up for Hulu, the free version or the paid version. And what's nice is you can actually skip the, paid, the commercials in Hulu. Just hit forward once or twice and you skipped it. You can get HBO Go, Amazon Video On Demand, and there's lots of other free applications as well. For instance, there's a plugin called uh, Free Cable. So what Free Cable does is it goes out to all the websites that have television shows and clips and it scrapes them and compiles them into one place. So I can watch everything that's available on the internet from ABC, Food Network, the CW Channel, History Channel, and watch it on my media center. <clears throat> There's also a program called NaviX. So NaviX is kind of one of these fringe areas. People will stream certain things to the internet and this catalogs it and you can find people streaming different things such as 
If you want to watch the entire season of Castle or uh, He-Man, Master of the Universe, why not, right? He-Man, awesome. What if you want to just watch regular live television? Well, <clears throat> this is a plug-in that talks to a device called the HD Home Run. So HD Home Run can come in from your uh, aerial antenna or from your uh, local cable provider if you have basic cable and it streams, it puts it out to the entire network. So you, your entire network has access to the television channels that are over the air. You also have plugins for music such as Pandora. So anything you have on Pandora you can play on the media center over, you know, over the television or over different parts of your network. Also has a uh, Groove Shark and, and other uh, media streaming. It also whenever it finds a file, so you have a file, you have a movie or whatever, or a TV show, whenever XBMC sees it on your NAS, it goes and says, I'm going to find out all the information about it. It grabs the plot information, all the pictures, all the background information, all the information about the actor. So if you just want to have a Samuel L. Jackson marathon, you can just go to that and every single movie you have with him will show up. You can also, if you have karaoke files, you can put that on your NAS, burn that to your NAS, and now you can have a, a big party and everyone comes over and sings, Losing my religion. Uh, okay, I'll keep my day job. Um, so that's a nice little plug-in, and once again, it's free. This is more about the metadata, so you put a, a movie out there that you burn legally, I'm sure you acquire it, you legally acquire it, right? Everyone legally acquires their movies and put it on the network. And what, Torrent? I, don't, I didn't know what that means. Um, so you put it on the network. It configures the, the moviedatabase.org. It finds out everything about the movie, gives you the description and all, as I mentioned, all the, the fan art and things. You can, if you use Apple devices, you know Apple has AirPlay. So if you're sitting around the house and you have your iPad out and you want to watch a YouTube clip, you just hit the AirPlay button and it goes up to your screen and you can say, oh, look at this cool YouTube video or whatever, a family video that you took on someone's iPad, and it goes up to the screen. Here's my son, he's watching uh, Star Wars, uh, you know, Attack of the Clones, <clears throat> the animated series. So we have an HD projector there and the only thing running it is a tiny little box about this big. Uh, it doesn't have, even have a hard drive in it and all that does is it has XBMC loaded on it, it goes across the network uh, and this is my remote. So I'm a huge Doctor Who fan, in case you didn't notice, I am wearing Doctor Who's outfit, the 10th Doctor, David Tennant, the best Doctor ever. And that's my remote. I have a sonic screwdriver from the 11th Doctor, and I can turn the volume up, turn the volume down, change the channel, swipe the channel, up, down, pause, pull, stop. <laughs> it's awesome. So whatever room, so I wanted it to be expandable. So you start with $35, you get a nice big TV later, you just buy a tiny little computer. It could be just a computer you have laying around and you can do it wirelessly or if you have Ethernet running through your house, which I'm sure you all do because we're all big nerds, you can stream it to any room. So the latest version of release is out XBM 12.0. It's very mature. It's not a startup. It's been around for years. Frodo is out. It now has HD audio. It also has PVR support as well. So you can record anything you want over, that's coming in over the air from your HD home run. And as mentioned, it runs pretty much on every single kind of platform you want. So I think this is the perfect setup for someone who wants to have a low cost, easy to use, Media Center, and just like the Joker, I think it deserves a golf clap. Thank you. I'm glad you ended on that. So, our next session is from another foreigner. Power, power to the immigrants. Uh, Steve Nealand. All right then. So, get my notes. Okay. Okay. Akara, Foilter, Stefano Nealand, Sam Dong, August Timon Shock, and Laurent Latry Fockel. Or in English, hello, my name is Steve Nealand. Welcome. I'm here today to talk to you about words. Because word, has it actually that thing? Okay. Because words, they form our thoughts. They shape our understanding of the world around us. And us in French, parce que le mot formé nous penser et fashioner 
notre compréhension du monde qui nous entoure. And I apologize to Frenchmen everywhere for my terrible accent and grammar. <laughs> Get the point. So what are words? Well, basically, words are thought. They, but more than that, they are a tool by which we form our thoughts and convey them from one person to another. Right this moment, my mind is forming thoughts. I'm using my words to define them. I'm converting them to sound, which you're hearing. Your brain is converting them back into thoughts. So I am literally putting my thoughts in your brains. That's pretty powerful. But as I demonstrated, there's different languages. So does that mean if you speak different languages, you, you think differently? Well, when I speak Irish, which I do terribly, I actually have to think differently. My grammar is different. My vocabulary is different. So the way I'm thinking is literally different. My motivation, my emotion is the same, but my actual thoughts are different. Which means the grammar and vac vocabulary that we have enables us or limits us to think. So if we all use text speak, we are actually limiting our capability to think. And this brings us on to labels. Labels can be positive and negative. They allow us to describe things. Family, friends, home, these are all very positive labels. But labels can also be negative. And if you'll forgive me, I'm going to use some common negative labels. Man, woman, young, old, black, white, foreigner, local, in certain contexts, these are very negative words, in certain contexts. So as individuals, it is up to us to be aware of who is speaking and to either accept or reject positive and negative labels. Because words do have power. Even if something is false, it's been shown that if you repeat it often enough, people will start to believe anything. So, and that forms ideas and opinions that are not in best interest. I'm not even going to speak these words because I've heard them too many times and I hope that from this point on I never hear them again because as false as they are, people start to believe when they hear this said often enough. But some people say, well, actions speak louder than words. It's not the pen that is mightier than the sword. Well, my argument to that is if you look at any battle in history, any conflict, it started with an argument. And the fight started with one word, charge. So how do we combat that? How do we become better people? We learn to listen. Like there, I Google listening, and there's something like 22 different types of listening by some definitions. The one I'm interested in is critical listening. To hear words, ignoring the bias of the speaker and our own bias, and to come to a, a sane decision myself. To learn to listen for what's not said, because a lot of what we hear today in the world around us is cherry-picked facts. Ignoring certain things, it's called marketing. We're all aware of it. And, and it's likewise with images. This is a very negative image. I see a man holding a gun to another man and a thousand words. Well, let's look at another picture. Let me cycle on. It is stuck. Here we go. This is a very positive image. We have a man helping another man with some water. And this is an uplifting image. But do you see any similarities between the two? It's slow. But regardless, what we need to do is learn to look for the whole image. We need to get, learn to get the whole story. And too often we don't see the whole story and we don't strive for it. And this brings me on to my final point, self-censoring. At this conference, I've heard several people say that they're gonna be careful of what they say because of another conference, we all know the one. And to a degree, political correctness is a good thing. But if we do too much of it, 
If we are afraid to speak our thoughts and be open about our feelings, we're creating an atmosphere of fear. And that creates a world where we are not being truthful with each other. And that creates a society that's fundamentally dishonest with itself. So I leave you with these thoughts, and I hope that we will all listen and think about the words we use. Thank you. So one thing I've been informed to let you know is that the um, device that Tim Cunningham had um, will also be a giveaway for CF Hour, who are apparently pimping themselves like crazy right now back there. Um, so the next presentation that we have uh, is with uh, Christian Reddy, and I can let you guys know that it's out of this world. Come on. No sympathy? No. <laughs> okay, well, uh, thank you very much. I'll go ahead and begin. I'm going to be talking tonight about discovering extrasolar planets, or as we refer to them in the field, exoplanets, uh, particularly with an emphasis on the Kepler Space Telescope. Kepler was launched four years ago this week and has been on a sole mission to detect an Earth-sized planet orbiting a star like our sun in its habitable zone. And I'm going to describe that in a second. But first, I want to back our story up to 1995 when 51 Pegasi b was discovered. This is the first planet ever discovered orbiting what's known as a main sequence star. That is to say, a star that's burning hydrogen and helium like our own sun is. The, star, as you, the planet, as you can see, is about half the mass of Jupiter and is orbiting so close it is boiling at 1,800 degrees. Meanwhile, in 2004, the Hubble Space Telescope imaged, directly imaged for the first time, a planet orbiting a star called Formahalt. This planet is far, far away from its parent star, but even so, we still have to use extensive techniques to, just to block out its light. So, observing a planet directly near a star is like trying to catch a match held next to a flood lamp. It's very difficult to detect, and what we're interested in knowing is whether or not this planet can exist in that magical distance called the habitable zone. So hotter stars have habitable zones farther away. Cooler stars have habitable zones that are much closer to their stars. We want to use Kepler to look at a single point in the sky, a very large, actually, area of the sky in the constellation Cygnus, looking at 150,000 stars all at the same time. Uh, this is accomplished by using 42 uh, large CCD detectors. And as you can see, even though it's a large part of the sky, Kepler is peering into a relatively small portion of our galaxy. So the idea here is a numbers game. We're trying to see if we can find planets around a nice selection of stars and use that to extrapolate to create statistics about the likelihood of Earth-sized planets elsewhere in our galaxy. But again, finding a, star, finding a planet next to its star is extremely difficult. So rather than trying to take a picture, what Kepler does is it tries to measure the tiny difference in its brightness as this planet transits in front of the star. So we take a light curve. So we're watching for that star to just flicker out. It's like turning off one light bulb out of 10,000. And what we have at the top is a uh, light curve of one particular planet. This is Kepler 22b. And as you can see, there's just that tiny little drop off in light measured once every 290 days. Here we have some phased light curves below. And you can infer things such as the relative size of the planet to a star. Uh, you can infer its, its uh, inclination. And by the way, there at the upper, upper right is a, an image of Jupiter what it would look like transiting our sun, comparing that to some of the planets that we've seen transiting stars. Again, these are not photos of stars, these are artists' impressions, but they give you an idea of how we can characterize the size of planets relative to the stars. And of course, we can characterize the size of the planets themselves. Most of the planets that were found early on were these massive, so-called hot Jupiters that orbit very close to their star. 
But then we began to find planets uh, about the size and even slightly smaller than Neptune. And we've even found a planet orbiting binary stars, which is very exciting because when I was studying astronomy, we weren't sure if a binary system could have planets. Of course it does. However, this, would, this particular planet is a gas giant, so there wouldn't be Mark Hamill looking up and seeing double sunsets. But if you were on a moon around this planet, whoa! Now, Things got really exciting just this year because we discovered a planetary system orbiting a star that's a bit cooler than our sun, but as you can see, Kepler 62, E, and F are right there in the habitable zone. They're larger than Earth, but they're right there. This is what we're looking for, and Kepler 69 is even more interesting. Here we're finding this planet only a, a little bit larger, about, well, about, you know, one and a half times the size of Earth. It's almost certainly a rocky world like our own planet. It's right there in the habitable zone, right there where the temperature is just right that maybe liquid water could exist and maybe life could exist. So we're narrowing down the statistics. We're taking Kepler's field of view and we're showing you all the different sizes of planets that we have detected. And there's quite a lot detected. We have 132 confirmed of these planets. Several of them are Earth size, but we have nearly 3,000 planets left yet unconfirmed that we're almost certain are there. So this is what astronomers really do. We take data and we plot it and we generate these correlation diagrams. You can see on the far right the relative sizes of planets, the planet radii. You can see Earth down there and we're looking for that one planet the size of Earth that has the same orbital period as Earth. And here is a beautiful plot. You'll see that most of the planets discovered to date are about the size of Neptune, but we're beginning to find Earth-sized planets. And yes, some of them are in their habitable zone. We haven't found exactly that one planet yet, but we're getting closer and closer. But we have so much data. Let's make apps out of them. This is Exoplanet. It's taking data that's on GitHub. I can't believe someone hasn't written an app by now. I've been speaking for three minutes. This is a cold vision conference. Come on. Anyway, get this app. It's free. It's fantastic. And it alerts you when a new planet is discovered. And you can look at the light curve. You can also visit Uwingo. And you can nominate a name for one of these exoplanets. I nominated uh, two planet names named after my mother and my mother-in-law gave them as certificates for Mother's Day. You can go to kepler.nasa.gov slash index.cfm and you can check out the latest on the Kepler mission. Unfortunately, and this is the part where I hope I don't uh, lose it here, um, just yesterday they announced uh, that Kepler suffered uh, a failure in one of its uh, three reaction wheels. It is presently unable to maintain the pointing necessary to take the data that is required. Uh, I have some good friends of mine who work on the Kepler mission. I know they're uh, a little bit sad, but they're also very happy because there's so much data and it's only a matter of time before that tiny signal of a Earth-sized planet around a star like our own sun is teased out and is found to be right there in the habitable zone. There are a hundred billion suns in our galaxy. Our Earth twins exist. Thank you so much for your time. For the best in community radio, tune into Codebase Radio 24-7. The best DJs, the best music, the best chat, and the best special events around the clock. Follow Codebase on Twitter, search for Codebase Radio on Facebook, and get the full rundown on all our great shows at CodebaseRadio.net. Join the fun and tune into the mighty Codebase Radio. Codebase Radio.